Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. Oh, <laughs> pretty. We were oh, yeah. we discussed this. <laughs> we have met, we have really upended <laughs> our entire hosting strategy here. <laughs> you take it away, Gabe. You've got this. All right. Okay. Let's reset. Ready? One, two, One, three. Two. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fossil Friday Chats. Today we have a very, very special treat because our very own co-host Brittany Stoneberg is moving from hosting to presenting duty as she talks about her very own research on little tiny horses. So Brittany, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Gabe. I am so excited to be here today, just as I am every other week. <laughs> <laughs> so. Today we're talking about my little doll pony is a horse, a horse, of course, even if it has three toes. Well, Brittany is going to be talking about that. So let me introduce you to Brittany, even though you've seen her on pretty much every episode. Um, <laughs> Brittany Elizabeth Stoneberg is the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Western Science Center in Hemet, California, the co-founder of Cosplay for Science, and a vertebrate paleontologist specializing in Miocene and Pleistocene mammals. She is currently pursuing her master's in environmental studies at California State University, Fullerton. Go Titans! Go Titans! Yeah! <laughs> so now I'm in the hot seat this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We get to ask all the questions from you instead of you asking the, co the guest questions today. Oh, goody! <laughs> it's I'm It's going to be great. Nah, it's going to be great. <laughs> it's gonna I'm be excited. Great. Okay. Uh, Gabe knows that I will talk about my little pony is at pretty much any opportunity. <laughs> It's true. It's true. <laughs> She'll even she sometimes found a way to work it into our Dungeons and Dragons sessions. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so now all you, all, everybody else has to listen to me uh, talk about my dull ponies, quote unquote. I feel like that's just weird seeing the two of us sometimes right here now because I'm always like remembering <laughs> there's someone in the middle. Right? Yeah, it's a bit weird for me because I am uh, currently just staring at my own presentation and I'm like, oh, where, where? Where's Gabe? Where's our guest? But it's me. <laughs> All right. Okay, back into the host mode. Ready? Okay, so Brittany, are you ready to talk about horses today? Absolutely. All right. Well, you're good to go for your presentation. Here you go. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hi. Uh, like Gabe said, and uh, as you should already know me, I'm Brittany Elizabeth Stoneberg. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Western Science. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, which are small, uh, dead, prehistoric ponies. Uh, my, we're going to be talking about My Little Doll Pony, the three-toed horses of Southern California today. Um, and so I hope you can uh, abide by all of my references and my general geeking out. Um, let's see. There we go. So a little bit about me, um, how it started. The picture on the left-hand side is me, the first time we went out to do field work uh, for these horses. That's me holding the first fossil I ever found, which is one of the horse teeth that ended up being part of the genesis for this entire project. And on the uh, right-hand side is me three years later, the day we published uh, our paper. Um, and so this is a project that I've been working on for three years, and it's very near and dear to my heart. And it's very important to me because uh, I don't have the traditional uh, path to a paleontologist, as we would call it um, sometimes. So uh, I actually have a undergraduate degree in English, English literature. Uh, so I did not know at the time uh, at the time that I was in college that I had any idea that I wanted to be a paleontologist. I liked science, I liked natural history, um, but I was really discouraged away from doing science. I was explicitly told I wasn't very good at it by my teachers. And so when I got to college, I decided to go in a different direction. Uh, but later on, after I graduated, I was trying to figure out uh, what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, a visit to a natural history museum, specifically the La Brea Tar Pits, kind of sparked that interest in me. And I decided, oh, however I can do it, this is what I want to do. I want to be the person behind the glass, looking at these fossils, figuring out what's going on with them, and telling other people about them. So long story short, that led to me volunteering at the amazing Western Science Center in Hemet, uh, where I've been for the past six years in various capacities. Um, I started out as a volunteer and now, um, you know, I host Fossil Friday chats every week and get to talk to people about science. And um, I am really excited that I had that opportunity. And so 
I'm sure if you guys have any questions later about my specific paths of paleontology, um, feel free to ask them. I'm really an advocate for, you know, unusual, different ways of getting to where you want to go in your career. So how did I stumble on this research? You know, I started out as a volunteer and my job title is Outreach and Communications Coordinator. So what am I doing doing actual scientific research? And my game is has always been that, you know, I can't do, I can't talk about science if I don't know how to do science. So I went to my boss, Dr. Alton Dooley, who uh, was a co-author on this research and just said, hi boss, I, I kind of want to do research. Can you kind of guide me through that? And uh, my boss being the amazing person he is was like, absolutely. Um, let's go out. We have this field site uh, in the San Bernardino National Forest, uh, shown to us by Kathleen Springer and Eric Scott, uh, the latter of whom is also another co-author on this paper. And let's go dig up some things. And turns out we found um, lots of horse and camel teeth. And that's why I, I started, ended up researching. Uh, this is <laughs> a picture of your lovely author uh, lounging across our field site. Um, there's another picture of me at the ALF Museum. Uh, so this project incorporated both going out into the field and then going out um, to other museums to look at fossils. And also, uh, I do love these horses so much that I have tattoos of them. And so uh, starting out in 2018, going on till now, uh, this was really just a labor of a way for me to really dig into the scientific process. So when I talk about horses, uh, what am I talking about? I am not talking about uh, the big modern day horses that you see today. We are talking about much smaller three toed horses, just like this model that you see before. And if you look down, you can kind of see that it has the three toes. Uh, so we're talking about much smaller animals than the modern horses you might be used to. Uh, I find them horrendously adorable and I hope you do too. And this photo was taken by uh, Dr. Alton Dooley and kind of gives you a we're going to be showing a lot of teeth today, and that's what the majority of my research is based on. So I kind of wanted to give you a visual representation of the rest of the animal, to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. So uh, my research is specifically based in the Cajon Valley Formation, that's in the San Bernardino National Forest. Uh, it's from the Miocene Epoch, which is 23, uh, let's see, uh, 2.3 to 5.3 sorry, 23 to 53 million years ago, um, just about. Actually, I think I've written that down wrong. Uh, but the Cajon Valley Formation fossils that we're looking at is 16.5 to 14 million years ago. So that's the age range that we're looking at for our horses. Um, and so this site had actually been excavated uh, by paleontologists throughout the years. Uh, there's been some plenty of research done on it. And so we're just kind of continuing in that tradition here today. So what did we find? We found lots of teeth, um, lots of teeth. Uh, a few other scattering of other bones, but uh, the majority of my research is the teeth and trying to figure out what have we got? That's where we started. What kind of horses do we have at the This project was definitely an example in how uh, projects expand. I started out with just trying to figure out what horses we had. And as you'll see, uh, it ended up uh, putting through a lot more questions uh, than answers actually, which I think is the best part of science. So looking at all the teeth, we eventually figured out that we had three horses in one location. And I always say, uh, you could call them small, medium, large in terms of size, but in my head, I always say tall, grande, venti. <laughs> and so you have Archaeohippus morninii, which is one of the horses that we found, Parahippus bravidens, which is an especially interesting find, and Scaphahippus sumini. Um, and so these are the three horses that we found at our field site. And finding these three particular horses ended up revealing a lot about the Cajon Valley formation and the environment in California during the Miocene Epoch. First off, I want to start with Archaeohippus morninii. Um, this was not a surprise to find. Archaeohippus morninii is actually pretty common in the Cone Valley Formation and had been reported multiple times before. So when we found these extraordinarily tiny horse teeth, uh, we were not surprised at all. So that one was kind of a given. We're like, oh, we definitely have Ar Archaeohippus morninii here. And I do wanted to show this uh, skull of an Archaeohippus 
Thank you at this morning specimen uh, from the Los Angeles uh, Museum. Uh, and you can see the scale bar there. It's about the size of a credit card. This is a very tiny horse, um, incredibly cute. Um, so again, this was a horse we were not surprised to find, so we were glad to get confirmation. But it definitely was uh, not the most interesting part of the project. We were about to find much more unusual horses as we went forward. So this one was fun. This is Scaphipus Um, This is the uh, largest of the three horses that we found in oh, I'm kind of doing this out of order because uh, Paraphus is very interesting. And uh, Scaphahippus sumini, uh, we found out pretty quickly that we had Scaphahippus, but when we were looking at the, um, when we were looking at the fossils that we found, we were, we were trying to figure out, you know, what species do we have? How did we uh, center on Scaphahippus sumini when there are actually two species of Scaphahippus, Intermontanus and sumini? Which one do we have? So we dug deep and the answer surprised us. So uh, um, we kind of have this prehistoric horse matchup going here, actually. You have Scaphahippus sumini and you have Scaphahippus intermontanus, these two species of prehistoric horse. Scaphahippus sumini has a much wider range. You can find it all over. You find it in Nebraska, you find it in New Mexico, you find it in Colorado, and you find it in California, um, uh, according to the literature, uh, including, uh, as will become very important later, the Barstow Formation. Scaphahippus intermontanus Innis, on the other hand, has a much more limited range, and it's mostly just in the Barstow Formation, just that. So you have Scaphahippus sumini with a much larger range, and you have Scaphahippus intermontanus with a much more uh, restricted range. Um, but they do overlap in space and time. So how do you tell these two horses apart when they can end up occupying the same space? Well, um, what previous literature had said, um, so Scaphahippus is a type of uh, genus of horse that was originally put in a much larger genus of horses called Merikippus and was pulled out later. And so with Scaphahippus, what they say is, and we're going to get into some technical terms, the morphology. So basically, the physicality of the tooth had this thing called plications. And I'll go into all of that and show you what plications are, because uh, it is a little complex, but we're going to get through it together. And so with Scaphippus sumini, they say that their teeth patterns basically are more complex. And Scaphippus intermontanus has much simpler teeth. Uh, the, the patterns in the teeth are uh, much simpler in comparison to sumini. So that's what these two differences between the two horses were. Great. So uh, this is, we're just going to get into a little uh, anatomy lesson. So when I talk about placations, I am talking about these little squiggly lines in the very, very center of the tooth enamel. Um, so those little bumps that you see in the middle, you can count those. And if you have a lot of them, you have a more complex tooth pattern. If you have fewer of them, you say you have a more uh, simple pattern. Um, I, you know, placations, protoconial, protocone, there's a lot of fancy terms for horse teeth, and I still tend to call them squiggly lines. You know, it is what it is. You, you have to use the technical terms in the paper, uh, but sometimes you just want to call them squiggly little lines. So this ended up being very difficult for us as scientists because uh, my colleagues and I would go to places like the ALF Museum that had way more horse teeth than we did in our sample, trying to figure out, okay, here we have a bunch of Scaphahippus teeth, and we're trying to figure out which species we have. We really want to get down to the species level. Um, what species of uh, Scaphahippus is hanging around in Cajon Valley Formation? And it ended up being super hard. And, uh, you know, science can be a really frustrating process. And I remember telling my co-authors that I almost cried when I went to um, a couple of these museums trying to figure out what we had because I could not tell the difference between a Scaphahippus intermontanus tooth and a Scaphahippus sumini tooth. I could not do it. If you if you gave me an entire drawer full of individual teeth and I counted the plications, I could not figure out if I had a Scaphahippus sumini tooth or intermontanus tooth. It was getting very confusing. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, what have we actually got? And so uh, Darren Pagnack, who's a paleontologist who uh, named the Scaphahippus genus, genus, he's done so much work in the Barstow and the Cajon Valley Formation, he's is great, um, actually quantified uh, this, like, like how many little squiggly lines, how many placations uh, would you find in a intermontanus tooth as opposed to a sumini tooth so that you could tell the two apart. And so uh, 
he said that uh, it Scaphibus intermontanus would you would have an average of two plications in the middle with a maximum of four, and whereas Sumini you would have an average of three plications with a maximum of seven. So you know going from that intermont uh, Sumini having more complex and intermontanus having simpler. So with that in mind, we're, we're like okay, let's go ahead and do this. But then we started looking instead of just looking at individual teeth. We started looking at full tooth rows. Um, you always want to look at full tooth rows if you can. You want to know um, where the tooth is in position and you want to look at the other teeth. And that's when things kind of hit a light bulb moment for us. So these are two tooth rows, uh, both from um, Los Angeles County Museum. They have these beautiful tooth rows of these horses. Uh, and as labeled, the top was Scaphahippus intermontanus and the uh, bottom was the Sumini. And so these are both horses that were from the same general area. So again, they were overlapping. So how are we supposed to tell the difference? Well, okay, we're gonna look at the plications at these squiggly little lines in the middle and we'll figure it out. Except when we did that, uh, it got a little more complex. So I've actually numbered here the number of plications uh, that you can see. And so if you remember correctly, as defined, uh, with a, a Scaphahippus intermontanus, you're only supposed to have a maximum of four plications. And here, here we had five, which would officially push it into a complex morphology. Uh, we would consider that a complex tooth. So if I found that top on that top tooth row, that tooth that is labeled five, if I found it isolated all by itself, I would probably rightly, um, I would probably assume that it was actually a Sumini tooth and not intermontanus. And so, and also if you go down to the Sumini tooth row, you're not supposed to be able to have a tooth with only one plication for Sumini. And again, if that tooth was isolated, I probably would have thought it was actually intermontanus, which we, oh, that actually revealed a lot about our confusion. And me and my co-authors looked at each other and were like, oh my goodness, we're looking at the same horse. And I hope everybody here is <laughs> old enough to get this, this, uh, this, this joke. Um, so yes, we actually realized that uh, we'd gone into this with an incorrect assumption. We'd assumed that there were absolutely two species of Scaphahithmus, uh, when actually we ended up not finding enough justification to say that there were two whole species. And so now what I've gone and done is uh, Sunk Intermontanus. So Scaphahithmus sumini, that name was named first. And so it has what's called taxonomic priority which just means, you know, if we are going to default to calling this one species of horse, we're going to go with the original name. So now, I'm sorry, Scaphohippus intermontanus doesn't technically exist anymore. We now say there's only one species of Scaphohippus sumini. And so that was really cool to get through um, and uh, to get to at the end of this research and trying to figure out, you know, what species we had. And it ended up, we were able to really further focus on what horses we actually have in California, you know, and take out, take off one of these species that uh, turned out not to be valid. Um, horse taxonomy, super fun. So I wanted to say uh, what is probably the best for last. This is Parahippus brevidens. And so this one was a total surprise. Um, this is only, this is one tooth. We only found one really good parahippus tooth in our entire sample. Um, there's probably another one that we could say is re re reasonably say is also parahippus, but it's so worn um, that we're really only making that uh, guess based on size. A couple of important things with uh, parahippus again, and I know lots of fancy words, but don't worry. Uh, in parahippus, you also have plications. You have a little isolated circle on the side, which is called a hypostyle. Um, but the most important part of parahippus, arguably, is the fact that it's very ear shaped. You have uh, this curve to it that ended up being uh, a really important, important part of the identification for this because we found this tooth and it didn't look like any of the other teeth that we had found um, that we had found in our sample. And it didn't look like a lot of any of the other horse teeth from Cone Valley Formation at other museums. We were super confused. We're like, this is a bit unusual. You know, it doesn't look like what we found before and we only have one of it. What does that mean? So we dug, dug, dug through the literature, trying to find a uh, another horse tooth that would kind of 
pinpoint us what we were looking at. And we did find one. We found another horse tooth. We found another horse tooth that was actually the exact same position with a very similar wear state. Uh, this is Parahippus brevidens. It's actually the holotype of Parahippus brevidens. So that means it's the uh, it's the specimen on which the animal is described and named on. Uh, so this is actually from Oregon. And so we realized, oh my goodness, we have Parahippus brevidens, which means Parahippus brevidens has been found not only in Oregon and in Central California, but we have the first confirmed record of Parahippus brevidens making it down to Southern California. Holy range extension, Batman. Suddenly we've gone uh, much further down and we finally have a record of, of this horse showing up in Southern California where we were not expecting to find it. As we dug through earlier, uh, as we dug through the literature and databases, we did find out that previous people who had uh, excavated in the Cajon Valley formation had reported possible parahippus specimens in databases, um, but it had never been confirmed. And so now we can officially confirm parahippus brevidens, uh, which is a uh, another horse, a three-toed horse, made it to Southern California and did appear here um, in the Cajon Valley formation, which was super exciting. Uh, this ended up uh, really extending the range for Parahippus. Um, and so now we know, you know, it made it up and down the West Coast. Um, so that was incredibly exciting. It was not something we were expecting to find. Um, also, I just feel super lucky that we got that tooth. It was like the perfect tooth position and the perfect wear state to be able to really know um, that what we were looking at was the same horse that had been found in the Maskell Formation in Oregon. Sometimes you get really, really, really fortunate. Um, and so you can tell a lot of information about an entire species and about an entire environment just from one singular little tooth, um, which I find absolutely fascinating is what I particularly love about all of these beautiful little horses. So we have three horses. We have Scaphippus subini, we have Parapus brevidens, and so we have Archaeohippus morninii. Why does that matter? You know, why would I spend all this time and three years of research just trying to figure out what horses I had at a particular site? Well, knowing what animals you have at a particular site can open up all sorts of questions about the environment that they're living in. And so in our paper, we touched on a few of the ecological implications of having these different animals at the Cone Valley Formation and we specifically compared it to the Barstow Formation, uh, which is coeval in time, the Cone Valley Formation, which means they're roughly um, the same age. And they're also not that far away from each other. And so you would expect normally that they would have very similar fauna. You would have, if what you find in the Cone Valley Formation, you would probably find in the Barstow, but that doesn't pan out. Um, so I, I made this little chart that kind of shows you, we have Scaphiphus sumini, uh, which is again our bigger horse. You find it in both the Cone Valley Formation and in the Barstow. Parahippus brevidens, which we just discussed, you find in the Cone Valley Formation, but so far there's not really a record of it in the Barstow Formation. For whatever reason, it didn't really make it over there and we don't know why. Archaeopus morninii, which I talked about earlier as being you know something that we were not surprised to find in the Cone Valley Formation at all, is actually kind of exciting. We don't really find it in the Barstow. It does show up there sometimes, but not to the level that it does in the Cone Valley Formation. Why is that? Don't know yet. Um, and this also bears out with um, larger bodied animals as well, not just these small horses. Uh, you have in the Cone Valley Formation, you have these really cool animals called Calicotheres. And I am so mad so far that I have not one found found one yet for myself. That is my dream, is to go into the Cajon Valley Formation and find Calicothere. But Calicotheres are these very large, very weird animals, um, kind of giraffe, gorilla, weird things. They're very strange. And so they're in the Cajon Valley Formation, but they don't really show up in the Barstow. And what you get in the Barstow Formation are, instead are Hypohippus affinis and Megahippus McKenai, which are these much larger horses that we don't see in the Cajon Valley Formation. So this is why a couple of horse teeth and knowing what those horses are is so important. Um, you know, it doesn't seem flashy, but just knowing that we have these horses here in the Hakone Valley Formation has suddenly given us a wealth of information to compare it to, to other formations in Southern California. This is really giving us 
a much larger idea of what my scene California would have looked like. And I am of the opinion that if we know what the past looked like, we can be a little more informed as we go into the future. And so as with pretty much all science, this paper that I wrote ended up asking more questions than it answered, but that's the fun part. And so I'm really excited to go forward and figure out what really is going on in the Cajon Valley formation, maybe compare it more with the Barstow and understand what Southern California looked like during the Miocene. So all that to say, uh, I want to end on this cute little story. So why have I been calling them doll ponies this entire talk? Uh, not just because it's cute, but actually, while I was doing um, my literature review for this um, for this research, I actually found this amazing mention uh, by the Riverside Daily Press uh, in 1913. So, paleontologist John Miriam was working in the area, and uh, the local paper reported on his activities, and they were talking about uh, the horses that he was finding which they said showed an undeniable, uh, a horse, a tiny Eocene horse shows undeniable kinship with this vastly old doll pony, which was no bigger than a fox. And so I just ran with that. I thought that was so cute. And, and I think really shows that people have been interested in these tiny horses in California for a very long time. And I'm excited to kind of continue that legacy and figure out more as we go forward. So thank you everybody. Uh, thank Thank you to Gabe for uh, dealing with all the tech stuff and the chat while I was uh, doing this. I want to especially thank my co-authors on the paper, Dr. Alton Dooley, Dr. Andrew McDonald, Eric Scott, and uh, Charlotte J. Homan for helping me so much. Um, this project really was a team effort. Thank you to the Western Science Center and the ELF Museum. Thank you especially to Kathleen Springer, uh, who helped us, uh, who basically showed us the site. Um, and thank you to all of these organizations as well. And uh, uh, thank you guys for watching. And I hope you didn't mind me rambling on a bit about horses for 20 minutes. And so I would be more than happy to take any questions about the horses, about museum life, about uh, my path as a paleontologist. And thank you, everybody. I was supposed to be monitoring the chat. Oops. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> who knows what they've said? Who knows what they've said in there? <laughs> who knows that was... what happened when I wasn't there to babysit? <laughs> oh, you guys are fine. You guys are great. That was a great presentation, Brittany. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing that with us. I yeah, just want to say you. really quick, like how proud I am of you, Brittany, <laughs> and like how awesome it is to see you be able to like present your own research on the show. Because Brittany and I have known each other for a while now, and we both Long kind of time. started our, our paleontology career like at the same time and you know mm -hmm. you know by that point Brittany was still working was still like working just starting to work at the western science center and she would talk about all the time how she wanted to be a real <laughs> quote real scientist i will get into that whole thing about real scientists but anyway she yeah. always talked about that how she wants to produce a paper and look at she did it and she's presenting her own research so great job Brittany. i'm very oh, proud of you and it's you. awesome to see so now you can say that you even though you didn't need it, because we kept talking about that, but you have a professional paleontological yep. paper now, so. I do, and yeah, and uh, if anybody wants to read the paper, it is available on PaleoBios for open access. We're very into open access at the Western Science Center, so you don't need to pay to read it. And uh, no, thanks to Gabe, because uh, you know Gabe was there for all of my like, can I do this? Am I actually capable of this? And always encouraged me, and so. Yeah, if you if anybody here is wondering, you know, how do I become a paleontologist? My one advice is uh, make mentors and make friends who are gonna, you know, keep kicking your butt to keep doing the things you want to do, even though you're a little afraid you can't do them. That's very very <laughs> true. Brittany has always been super supportive, but the problem is for me and Brittany also is we continue to egg each other on when we're like, oh my true. gosh, I'm so tired. I don't know if I have any more time. And then and then one of us will go like, but I have this great idea. And we're like, okay, no, let's do it. Yeah, go do it. You got this. So, okay, <laughs> questions, Brittany. First question, going yeah. from English major or journalism major, right, to paleontology. English, but with journalism dissertations, yeah. Okay, cool. But like, how, what is it exactly that caused, that like, just drew you in? What was it about paleontology or science even that just made you want to be like, not this, I want this? Yeah, so 
um, I'd always loved science since I was a kid. Uh, I think I was that classic child who was like, well, I want to be a paleontologist and I want to be a zoologist and I want to be a marine biologist all at the same time. So, you know, I'd always had this love of science growing up and love of the environment and um, whatnot. But, you know, as I got into school, my grade, my math grades were uh, pretty abysmal and I wasn't super good at science either. And so my teachers definitely pushed me towards uh, the other thing I loved, which was reading and writing. You know, I still love that. And so that was sort of what I was uh, pivoted towards in my education. Um, and, and I realized, like, as much as I loved my English degree, I don't regret having an English degree at all, actually. I feel like that has really taught me how to communicate. And so it's actually been really valuable. But, you know, I graduated and was like, oh, no, one, what do I want? Like, what do I do with my life? You know, the quarter life crisis. And uh, I also realized that a lot of the jobs that I kind of tried after after graduating, you know, tried being a journalist, tried being an editor, tried all these things, you know, trying to see what I wanted to do. And I realized, okay, I don't want to do any of that. What now? And so I kind of floundered for a bit. Um, and going to a museum was really what cemented it. I went to the Librea Tar Pits, and they have that bubble where you can see into the lab and you can see the the scientists working on the collections and suddenly it, it it feels cliche to say it was like a light bulb moment but suddenly I was like oh that in whatever capacity I can do it that's what I want to do and I had no idea how I was going to make that happen at all but uh, I was very fortunate to grow up in Hemet and live right next to the Western Science Center and like I said I just was like all right I don't know how I'm going to do this but I need to be involved in this in some capacity so I volunteered and then they were crazy enough to hire me and then crazy enough to promote me and uh it's been uh been there for the last six years and so um so part of it was you know seeing a museum I will always talk about the power of museums and their uh the way they're able to inspire people to want to follow science um but also just having people who encouraged me um it's what kept me there, definitely. So what you're saying is sometimes it's not about getting your foot in door. It's about breaking down the door, sitting in the door frame, and saying, I'm here now. <laughs> uh-huh. Saying, hi. <laughs> I'm here now. Let me... Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. We had a slight blip in the internet because the internet, for some reason, hates us here in Rancho Cucamonga. But okay, anyway. <laughs> um, so, okay. So let's go to some questions now in the chat. Okay. Um, awesome. First question. Uh, this is actually from Aaron Brown, eight years old. Um, would like <gasps> to know how it makes you feel when you find a horse tooth. Ooh, it makes you feel really good. Uh it was uh, really amazing since a horse tooth is really the first fossil I ever found. Uh, just this little brown piece of enamel sticking out of the side of the ground. It makes me feel really good. Um, it's really cool to find a fossil and know that you're like the first person to see it in millions of years. Uh, that's a really, really cool feeling. Uh, it's almost hard to describe, but it, it feels so good. And I now, now, you know, I'm always excited when I find a horse tooth because you know these are the animals I study right now so I get to know a little bit more every time I find another horse tooth so it's really exciting <laughs> you like horse teeth so much you have one two tattoos one right two you I have, have two, two, ta two horse teeth tattoos <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I love them so much I put them on my skin forever <laughs> <laughs> um next question is from Bailey <laughs> Which doll pony would be best to carry around in a big purse? Oh my god, Archaeohippus, because it's the smallest. Yeah, Archaeohippus, uh -huh. definitely. It. Oh my god, it'd be so cute. If you. Oh, if you get to carry it around in like a little cat backpack. That's <laughs> that's what I would do. I can't, can't just imagine you're walking. You're like, uh, this is my emotional support doll pony. 
Oh, if he's so cute, a little ho- with his little hooves with the three toes. Oh, yeah, that's what that's what I would do. Is I would, you know, I've seen some artists do um some do some like paleo pets, and that would be my paleo pet is my little doll pony in a backpack. Um, let's see. So here's a question for you: mm-hmm. when when someone is like trying to decide to go into paleontology, right? We talked, you talked a little bit into your path in, in your presentation. Yeah. A lot of people think that there's like one pathway, right? Obviously you've shown mm-hmm. that's not the thing, but like, what is it? What would you say is like the best thing to think about when you're like trying to get into a school, trying to like find a place to volunteer yeah. um, besides sitting in the doorway and saying, I'm not moving anymore. But like, what would you say is like the best <laughs> way people to now. figure that out? Yeah, um, I would think the the way that, I, and I think it'd be the same advice I give to any to anybody thinking about any sort of career. Don't even, do, not even just think about what you like doing. Think about what you don't like doing, because um, that's going to help you narrow it down. I think working in paleontology, working in museums, you kind of have to be willing to wear a lot of hats. Um, so you know, like I love research, but it's not my only job, um, and I love communications and outreach, but it's not my only job. So you really need to think about what skills you have, what you like doing, but what you really don't like doing and kind of what direction you want to steer things in. Um, so there's lots of opportunities. Uh, and in terms of like, you know, we've talked about how a paleontologist can be somebody who prepares fossils. It could be somebody who talks about fossils, you know, and like my job with outreach and communications coordinating. Um, it could be somebody who manages the collections. It could be somebody who goes out into the field. It could be somebody who does uh, computes data. Um, so think about what you like, think about what you don't like, and um, just be willing to like try your hand to anything. Um, like I said, especially in museums, you got to wear a lot of hats, and I think that's good. Kind of develops your skill set. It's true. We, Brittany and I, both wear hats on hats on hats sometimes at the mm-hmm. at so our many museum. hats. Just the hats are tipping over, and every you know, I think everybody at our museum does. You know, everybody kind of kind of contributes in multiple different ways. Every now and then it's hats, and then we even, like, add a little fascinator just because, like, there's that one little uh-huh. extra thing you have to do. That little um, extra thing you got to <laughs> put on top. Here's a question from Sarah um, Compagna, a.k.a. Mermaid Labs. Uh, Hi. Sarah missed the scale on your horses. Can you tell us again how big, small the different horses you talked about are? Yeah. So, um, let's see. The, uh, so, hold on. Do I have it here? Ah, there'll be too much to, I was actually going to bring out a 3D print. So uh, the, the horse teeth that I'm looking at can be very, very itty bitty. Like you can find an archaeohypus tooth that just kind of fits in the width of my finger there. Um, so you could have a horse that's like roughly comes up to your knee to like a horse that comes like a scaphohypus roughly might come up to like somebody's hip or waist. Um, so these are not the animals that we see today where, you know, they're multiple shoulders uh, and they're taller than some humans. Um, these are much smaller. And um, yeah. And so let's see. Can I share my screen again? Or actually, I already canceled it out um, since we had technical difficulties. But yeah, so I showed that um, archaeohippus skull where it's basically like twice the size of a credit card. Um, so these are very tiny, tiny animals. Like... So, okay, what makes a horse a horse, actually, when we're talking about, like, you know, everyone thinks about horses today. That's a question. Well, yeah, I mean, mean, we've talked about this before when we talked about zebras versus horse, but we're not going to get into that today. Um, But anyway, uh, but yeah, what makes a horse a horse? If we're looking at fossil horses, some have three toes, some have one toes, they have different size variations, and like, so what actually is it that you're looking at that says a horse... Is a, a horse, horse of is a horse, of course. Yeah, so um, my uh, my horses uh, do fall under, like, ec- they're equids. So they are in the larger family of horses. So we're really just looking at uh, how these animals relate to each other. And you can look at, um, like, if I showed an equus horse. So equus is the genus that we have today. And I showed you like all of the plications and lines. It would look pretty different, but you could see that they that they're comparable. Um, that they, you know, they have all of these lines and little details that say, ah, this is a horse tooth. That is the nice thing about horses. Uh, um, even as you go back further and further into the Miocene, you pick up a horse tooth, you're like, ah, 
that's a horse. <laughs> it makes it easy to kind of find out. And so um, with my little, uh, my tiny little horses, you know, uh, they uh, are definitely related to the horses we have today. And so it's just looking at different characters and physica uh, uh, physical features. And so you get into the Pleistocene and into modern horses genetics and figuring out where they fit in that like phylogenetic tree. Cool, 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 cool. You didn't answer my question. Is a zebra a horse, though? I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Oh my goodness! Oh no, 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 no. We, our, our, our wider D and D friend group almost disintegrated over that. I'm still gonna say I'm right, but anyway, here's okay. a question from Jared. Uh, let's move on. Here's a question from Jared. If the Cajon and Barstow are different environments based on the presence or absence of certain animals, are those environments reflected in the sediments as well? Ooh, geology. Ooh, that's a good question. And I don't know. See, but that's a good, good, that's a good question and a good avenue to look at because, you know, we don't know what's causing the differences. Um, you know, is it you know, is there a big old geological formation that was in the way during uh, during the Miocene that restricted movement? You know, was it just uh, different habitats? We have no, at this point, I don't know. But that's kind of what I am interested in figuring out is like, you know, what's actually causing these faunal differences? And so geology would be another way of trying to investigate that question. You know, can we see the differences reflected not only in the faunal list that we're putting together, but can we see it reflected in the geology? Can we see it reflected in uh, uh, the paleobotany, if we can find any? Um, that's an interesting question. And so that's kind of where I want to take this research in the future. You know, like I love my time. I'm going to keep looking at these tiny horses and see, you know, what we can tell in the differences between the Barstow and the Cajon Valley. Nice. Oh, now um, my mind's going like, oh, I gotta look at, I gotta look at research it, into this. And isn't see. that how that works sometimes though? You're just like, you think you're like, okay, Ooh. it's just out of nowhere. You get one question, and all of a sudden your mind does like that whole like branching thing where you're like, okay, what if we do this? What if we do this? What mm -hmm. happens if this goes here? That's like one of my favorite parts of science though. Is like, oh yeah. So it's one tiny thing can spark a million different questions. You know, oh, you yeah. hear me say it all the time. I'm like, every fossil is <laughs> worth a thousand stories and questions, and it's mm -hmm. like. That's one of my favorite things about it. Yeah, it'd be kind of boring if I did all this horse research and then I was like, cool, well, that's it. You know, there's some horses. That's all we got. That's murder she wrote. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad that it does uh, bring up questions. And, you know, that gives me more fun to look at and figure out, okay, what's going on between these two formations? Like, what what are these animals trying to tell us? Who knows? And, then, you know, it, it could be down to simple things. Like, you know, I, I talked about how... We have Parahippus, and it's not in the Barstow. Now, the Barstow has been heavily excavated, so, so if we haven't found the Parahippus, this, you kind of think it's not there. But I can't say, that, you know, Cone Valley's been excavated for 40 years, so who knows? Maybe next year you guys go to the Barstow and you find a Parahippus tooth, and I'm like, oh, okay, so they were in both areas, so it's not that different. But we don't know. Yeah, and like... You know, the fossil record is incomplete. It just may not oh, ever, there, we might not ever find evidence there. And then mm -hmm. that's what, that's science. Like whatever evidence we have, it changes our story. Like science is never just going to be like, this is it. This is the one thing. This will forever be what we know. It's what if we get new evidence, things will change. Like if you get new horse evidence, you'll be like, hey, there is much more horse evidence and zebras are totally a horse. Who knows? Oh my God. Okay, let's move on. More questions. <laughs> Uh, Sarah is asking phylogenetically what animals are horses related to that might surprise us. Ooh, hold on, that's a good question. So I need to look into this because I haven't uh, done too much of horse phylogenetics. But horses are very cool. What are? Let's see. So let me look into that. I will try and find out for you because I feel like there's definitely going to be some weird ones out there. Sweet. We'll make sure we get answers to that on the next time we're on the show. Uh, Aaron Brown would like to know how much these horses might have weighed. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, well, with Archaeohippus, I mean, you probably, maybe like the size of like a dog or some, like a smaller dog or something. You know what? I wonder if Archaeohippus would have weighed the same as Roxas. Probably more than that, but you know. Bro Roxas, <laughs> Roxas, Roxas is my corgi. So mm -hmm. that's the comparison you might need to use. 
on a, on, yeah, a, so... on a scale on a scale from horse from full size horse to corgi, where does it fit? <laughs> and now I'm just thinking of Archaeopithecus in a backpack again because I see that video of a corgi in a backpack. <laughs> So you could almost certainly, it, Archaeohippus is pretty small. You could almost certainly pick it up. I probably wouldn't pick up Scaphohippus because that's a, a that's a, a larger horse. Um, yeah. So that one would probably, probably, you could probably compare it to like a smaller pony maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know the exact weight. Well, like, I, I don't know if we, if we know what the exact weight would have been, would have been of these animals. We can only really make comparisons based on their size. Um and like I said, I kind of deal almost exclusively with the teeth right now. Because uh, in the Cone Valley Formation, we found a little bit, but not a lot of um, of things besides teeth. You know, um, for whatever reason, the way that the Cone Valley Formation preserves fossils um, makes it hard for things other, uh, makes it hard for certain things to preserve. And so we find a lot of tooth enamel, which is why we were kind of replete with tooth, uh, with horse, uh, horse teeth and some camel teeth and some other stuff. But um, so far in the Cone Valley Formation specifically, uh, we haven't at least in our West sample found a lot of teeth. Um, so why teeth? I mean, as a mammal paleontologist myself, yeah. like, why do mammal paleontologists or a lot of paleontologists like focus so much on teeth when it comes to research they can, of these things? Yeah, because they can tell you so much. So with horses specifically, it's great because um, because of all that complex like variation in the tooth and the molars, you can get down to, to the species level. So it happens with horses that a lot of their species identification is based on their teeth. So that's why I can say, even though I don't have any of the rest of the horse, like all I have of parahippus is this one tiny tooth. That's all I need because you don't need the rest of the horse to say that this horse is different from other horses. Um, so horse identification is really built specifically um, in a large part on the teeth. Um, so that's cool because, you know, that's great. I can find a single tooth out in the desert and I can know exactly what animal it's from. That's pretty cool. You can't always do that with, um, with some other, with some other animals. Uh, teeth can tell you, you know, in addition to like what species you have, it can tell you, um, possibly like what kind of, uh, what kind of food the animal might be eating. You know, if I find, uh, a carnivorous tooth, you know, or a tooth that like looks like it belongs to a carnivore, like, oh, it's probably going to be eating meat. Um, with horse teeth, I can look at it and be like, ah, this is a brachydon or hypsodont, you know, different wear states. This can tell me like, oh, this is eating grass or something to that effect. Uh, with mastodons and mammoths, uh, you we always talk about how you can tell the difference between a mastodon and mammoth through their teeth. Um, mammoths have this very flat grindy type of tooth surface that's great for eating grass um, whereas mastodons have these lobed teeth that's much better for eating uh, things like bushes and branches nuts and fruits and things like that so you can tell what animal you have from a tooth you can tell what that animal might have been eating which is always helpful for figuring out um, it's like well if you have a lot of teeth that were probably adapted for eating grass your site might be a grassland um, so it can tell you all sorts of things, which I find super fascinating. And it's nice because teeth often preserve well. And so that's, that's take care of your teeth, everybody. So a future, somebody will find you one day. Well, so how, how is it that we know that these teeth, the way that they develop aren't like fingerprints, like the little, mm. what did you call them? The, uh, um, plications and whatnot. The plications. Like, how do that we is, know, how do you know yeah. that as a scientist that they don't like develop like fingerprints unique to each horse. Right. So they don't do, like, well, it depends. And it always depends. Um, because at some point it kind of does um, a little bit. You know, every tooth is going to have a unique uh, a unique wear state on it, which is part of why with Scaphohippus, we wanted to look at the full tooth rows um, because it's very difficult to make that sort of determination based on a singular tooth. And so, you know, mm -hmm. Even, you know, people today, if, you know, if everybody's been stressed with everything, you may be grinding your teeth. So, what, you know, the, the wear on your teeth might be uneven, and that's individual to you, you know. So with these horses, some of it indeed may be, um, may be down to individual wear. So you have to be careful of that. 
But for example, Parahippus, like I, again, I had one tooth and then I had another tooth from Oregon and they were, they were the same tooth physician and they were also at comparable wear states. And we could tell that the same features were showing up, you know, the same pla kind of placation, kind of in the same area. Um, the, uh, like the protocol was wearing away and separating from the rest of the tooth and that was happening at the same time as it happened in another tooth. So there are features that you can probably say are due to individuals, you know, based on how, you know, if a tooth, if a horse is favoring one side when it chews or something to that effect. But there are certain features that are congruent across different animals. But that is always a challenge. Um, how much of what we're looking at is due to individual variation how much of it is due to species level differentiation you know these are the questions you have to ask and so sometimes you know you know i i basically and my co-authors basically sunk an entire species because we decided there's not enough difference in the amount of plications to justify an entire species off of who knows somebody and that's the thing somebody could come come by in a hundred years as I came a hundred years after John Miriam and say, actually, sorry, uh, this isn't, you know, this is all due to individual wear. This is a paraphrase. I, I think I'm right, but you know, that's something we always have to be cognizant of. Cause you're right. There are, are certain features in teeth and in any bone that could be down to uh, individual variation. And the thing I always say, if you really want to make a paleontologist sweat, ask them if they would have considered a Chihuahua and a Great Dane the same species or not. So we always have to be very cognizant of, I know, right? We always have to be <laughs> cognizant of that kind of stuff, you know, like what we're actually saying when we're trying to figure species and everything else. And nature doesn't like to be put in a box, but we love to put things in boxes. So. True. Very true. Well, it looks like we have one time for one more question. And this one comes from Aaron Brown okay. from our, via our good friend, Dr. Ian Brown. Uh, Aaron would like to know when these horses went extinct. Apparently, paleontologist dad who works in Barstow answers are not good enough. <laughs> let's see. Um, for my specific horses, um, let's see. They probably went extinct towards, let's see. I would need to look it up. I don't remember off the top of my head head exactly when they go extinct see sometimes you have to say i don't remember or i don't know so but i think you're uh whatever your dad says it's right <laughs> there you go I'll, great I'll answer go back, that one back right yeah yeah i don't remember off the top of my head exactly when these uh when these horse species went extinct it was probably towards the end of the miocene um as the environment started to change and we moved into the pleistocene but as for the exact dates don't got them off the top of my head and um i'll i can look that up and find out that happens mm -hmm. i mean some people ask me a question i'm like uh, uh see everybody you gotta make sure you say you'd be willing to say i don't know because yeah. nobody has all of the answers yeah. and sometimes you just gotta google it yeah sometimes honest okay honestly so something for me as a paleontologist that i've always gotten nervous about is that um sometimes it's hard for me to remember like certain details you know i'm never gonna be as you can see now never I like to talk big picture things, but I'm never going to be that person who remembers the exact dates of when something went extinct or things like that. And so I actually have some of that, some of the uh, numbers and whatnot that I said in my talk written down because I know that's a weakness of mine. Um, I, you know, you work through it and sometimes you look at your own paper to remember what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, I guess that does it for us today. Thank you so much, Brittany, for joining us on Fossil oh, Friday Chats guys. today and talking about your horses. <laughs> if uh, if anyone wants to find out more about your research and the museum, where is the best place for them to go to? Yeah, so uh, I'm on social media at Brit, B-R-I-T-T, and A-N-D, Bone, B-O-N-E. Um, You're on social media? On I'm just kidding. I not now while well, I'm in uh, finishing up my graduate degree. Uh, so I'm not super active there anymore, but you can always uh, learn more about uh, the museum I work for, the Western Science Center. Uh, that's also online. You know, we'll talk about our horse research. We talk about our dinosaur research and all the cool stuff that we're, uh, that we're working on. Um, so right now, because my personal sci like my own personal psychom has dwindled while uh, finishing a master's degree is uh, time consuming kids. And so 
uh, I would definitely recommend you uh, keep up with uh, my research and my colleagues' research um, at the Western Science Center. Sweet. Well, put those in the links below because they're always there for each week. <laughs> um, so as always, Brittany, we end the show with one piece of advice for future paleontologists. What would that be? Okay. My piece of advice would find people who support you and encourage you. Because like I said, uh, I would not be doing research if my boss hadn't said, yeah, do that. I think you can do it. I wouldn't still be doing research if people like Gabe hadn't been encouraging me on the way saying, yes, you can definitely do this. So, you know, oh, so in addition to, you know, staying curious, um, helping where you can, uh, seeking out opportunities, really find people who are going to drive you forward. Um, kind of takes a village to make a scientist, I think. And so, and then also, uh, and pay it forward, you know, encourage other people, um, find other people who are interested in the same thing that you are and redo research with them. Uh, a lot of my research today wouldn't have been possible without my co-authors because I, this was a learning experience for me. When I started, I didn't know any, but are you now? I still don't know anything. There's still so much to learn. And part of that is learning from other people. So definitely find your mentors, find your support network and go forward with that. Great advice, Brittany. And speaking of support, I want to make a quick announcement. I want to say thank you so much, the Paleontological Society of America, yes. because Fossil Friday Chats, ALF Museum and Western Science Center is now the recipient of a amazing and well-appreciated grant from the Education and Outreach Committee to help support the show to continue on and be able to tell more stories from the world of paleontology. So thank you so much to um, uh, Dr. Um, I just blanked on everybody's name that I know them all. <laughs> Dr. It's Rowan Lockwood uh, and everybody else yeah. at the Education and Outreach Committee. Thank you so much for uh, for um, accepting our grant and uh, helping support Fossil Friday Chats. Um, well, that does it for today's show. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, and as always, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel um, for more stories from the world of paleontology. And we will see you all again real soon. Bye, everybody.